I'm Jack Barmester and you're watching utefans.net. Hey, Ute fans, welcome to another great episode of The Extra Point, brought to you by the Ken Garf University Club and presented by UteFans.net, the original home for Ute fans. I'm joined by the Rocket, Cal Beck, Gabe Reed, and Devin Kafusi. We just came off the field. We watched uh, Kyle Whittingham's press conference. What are your takeaways, Cal? Uh, they, uh, it's been a long time since we've experienced something like this, especially at home. Uh, there were, you know, keys to victory. We didn't check off. Whittingham's explicitly mentioned the turnover battle uh, being won. Uh, third down efficiency. We, our defense hasn't performed at the national ranking level that they have. Uh, the two things that Whittingham mentioned was the turnover battle that we lost. He said, honestly, not counting the turnover on downs one to one or minus one. And we got out physical. We were, their physical play dominated us on the lines. Initial takeaway is Gabe Reed. Yeah, I mean, I think Cal hit on it. Coach, Coach Witt's a straight shooter. He can be, you know, very direct. And uh, my biggest takeaway was we didn't win up front. You know, as a defensive lineman, I feel like that's where the game's won. Um, so if you can't win in the trenches, you can't set the tone there. It just kind of bleeds into the rest of the uh, offense and defense. So, Devin Kafusi. Yeah, I agree uh, with Gabe there to talk about it bleeding on. Um, I know able to get those stops or convert on offense. Uh, it just lets the game, you know, fall into your opponent's hands and you're kind of in a rush mode on how can we stop the bleeding. Credit to Oregon for coming in here, doing something not many people do, coming winning at Utah, let alone winning by a large margin. So like Witt said, was in the trenches uh, for us as well as the turnover battle. Credit to Oregon coming in and getting that done. Now, naturally, we want to bring up that this team is injured, and we wonder where they would be if they weren't. I mean, they started off 6-1, and one, which is pretty dang good. Uh, Kyle Whittingham said in his presser that no one wants to hear about that. You play with what you have. Right, Cal? It's no excuses. Uh, you play with what you have, and everybody gets ready for the next game. Uh, there were a couple things that people would want to cite. I mean, explosive plays. They had us beat on explosive plays. We were talking about that earlier. Uh, but nobody wants to hear about the injuries. It's, it's redundant, and everybody suffers them at this point. It's not the best football teams that win championships, but who is healthy and starting to play their best football team and starting to sink, wouldn't you think? Yeah. I, I think... For me personally, my perspective is injuries is not uh, a relevant issue in season. It's a recruiting thing. You have to have the depth just in the day and age that we live in. And because injuries is such a huge part of, of college football, you have to have the depth. It's, it's, it's a recruiting thing. It's not um, something that you can you know, rely on and say, oh, we were injured this year. Um, it's not an excuse. So, Devin, what do you think happened there on defense against the Ducks? I think the athleticism really shined through for the Ducks coming on around the edges. Um, you know, not you know, staying out of the middle, running, uh, really forcing stuff outside, one-on-one um, -on -one with the athletes, and just really chipping away there, getting, you know, those four yards, uh, carry, you know, those stack up and lead to a lot of first downs, um, getting Oregon to march down field. Like Witt said, um, yeah, got to some third down situations, just wasn't able to get out of third downs. And the offensive production was pretty poor. Cal, what do you think happened with the offense in this game? Uh, compared to last week, I said if we average close to five yards a carry, we'll dominate the time of possession, the ball, and we'll end up being on the positive side of things in the end. Today we averaged 2.3 yards a carry. I saw J.J. tweak his ankle in the first couple of series. He was mm -hmm. limping back and forth. They tried to get other people some carries, but that team speed overall, I think, for Oregon did play a was a was a variable that had an impact on the overall outcome today. Uh, yeah, not to beat a dead horse, but if the O line isn't getting the push that we need, the running backs can't. They can only break so many tackles. They can only make so many uh, moves within a tight tight window. Um, so, I think once again, it, it was a you know lack of surge from the from the offensive line was a was a big part of it. And obviously, it's a team 
thing, but yeah. And, and to add on to that, there was, there was no push on the offense. It seemed like they were getting into our gaps and playing gap, gap control football with their defensive line. Their offensive line was extremely stout and quick laterally mm-hmm. left to right. There was we, there just was no push. Yeah. And it, 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 and we're Sack Lake City. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How many sacks did we get today? Zero. Yeah, it's been a long time since that's happened. We did our off our defense didn't play the type of defense that we're used to playing. Mm-hmm. Cal, um, they were who we thought they were. They were who we they did. were who we they thought they were. We thought they were. Um, they can run. They can pass. They can defend. They can do everything. They're a legit contender for the CFP. I think. I think they're a dark horse at least. But what do you think? I mean, as a player, when you take a loss like this, because it does happen, and we get spoiled as fans. But when you take a loss like this, what's it like rebounding from it, Gabe Reed? Yeah, it's tough. I think you have two options. It's either fold or you get back up and you just come out swinging. So, Coach Whittingham mentioned it in his in his presser, like. This team has shown this season, you know, they took a loss to Oregon State, but they've shown the resilience uh, and the determination to get back up and and keep fighting. So I I would expect nothing less from our guys. And uh, we talk about, you know, what went wrong. I think for me, the most frustrating part is knowing that we have the talent, we have the speed, the strength that we need to to compete and to excel, but just wasn't, uh, wasn't out there on the field today. I have to ask as a fan, Uh, Is it possible that there was too much distraction with college game day coming into town? Did that affect the mentality of the players at all? I would say no. I I would put my money on the no side of things. I think our program has gotten to the stature and to the level that those outside influences, just like all the other outside influences and distractions would have. I mean, you look at the distractions that the team and the program have gone through in just the last three years. And this year, it just happens to be the injury bug. Mm -hmm. This program knows how to be resilient. And like Whittingham was saying in the press conference, good teams find ways to get better, find ways to get better, find ways to win. And what what do you think? Absolutely. I think like a Phoenix rising from the ashes, someone's going to step up in big games like this and throughout the season, mentioning the injuries and touching on what Coach Witt said. uh, Even Bailey even mentioned young guys being in positions, guys that are backups playing more. Everyone's just got to, you know, take that hard look in the mirror, you know, let this one sting, but move right and right on ahead. You know, don't let this team, this loss, drag into next week and affect them. You know, feel it now. Watch the film. Get better. You know, it's the Utah way, showing that, resili- that resiliency. This is when the next game mentality really comes to the to, to the benefit mm-hmm. of the team. I mean, it's it's easy to get on an emotional high like last week and say, oh, you know, one game at a time. But when you feel this, you've got to – you got to face the piper. You got to have go through Bloody Tuesday, but it's the next game. You're not thinking about the conspiracy conspiracy theory wall trying to connect dots like we were talking earlier. How they can still qualify for the CFP? How yeah. they can qualify yeah. for the conference championship? These players aren't drawing or connecting those dots yet. They're still thinking about we've got Arizona State coming next week. And where do we look in terms of the Pac-12 title race? Is it over for us? If if last year was was a, a <laughs> lesson to be learned, I'd say no. You never know, especially in this conference, given the, you know, anybody can win any game mentality that's kind of prevalent. It's it's a toss up every year, so we have no other option but to continue just keep winning, uh, keep fighting, and I think the best players and the best teams stay level and even throughout the highs and lows. Um, they're able to to maintain the focus. So, and looking forward next week to ASU, who played Washington pretty close the other week. I mean, I'm not sure that game's a gimme. And is is that here? I think yes. I think it is in Rice Eccles. So we should win that game. What are we looking at with this Arizona State team, Cal? Uh, we're looking for revenge. We're looking to get back on track. We're looking to establish who we are, the house that we play in, and what people can do. Hopefully we'll get some more players back uh, off the injury train, but it's an opportunity to take a step forward, and it's an easier opportunity than if we're playing on the road or if it was back-to-back big games. Mm -hmm. And one last question, how does NIL factor into this contest? I mean, the joke is that Oregon is Phil Knight University. Did that make any difference in the game today? I'll say real quickly, you'll never know. 
I mean, to add up how much they're paying in NIL, no one would really know to, to compare them in the schools to say they're outspending or any of that. Their team explosiveness was better than ours today. And then we got physically outplayed. Now, if that's relayed to how much money they're making on an income or why they're there, I, I quite don't know. However, I have had an issue, and I'll finish this real quick, with Bo Nix specifically because he was one of the first quarterbacks to jump ship for primarily an NIL deal. And me being an old schooler, I didn't like the landscape of college football changing with that lead. So I've tried to dislike him in, in the recent past and all the other ones jumping ship for money. But it is the name of the game now. And it's something that we do need to discuss of are, is the available amount of money to players coming, is it part of the recruiting process now? Devin, do you have any thoughts on that? Most definitely. Uh, this is a you know a new era of college football that we haven't seen before, especially as an old timer. <laughs> and, um, NIL, the transfer portal, um, it's a crazy whirlwind happening. You know, it's a wild, wild west out there. Moving forward, it's definitely going to play and have a huge impact. Um, I mentioned, I think I've heard Deion Sanders talk about it's going to re affect recruiting out of high school at this point, even not even looking there, just being able to look into the portal and then you know flash some green here and there to get the team that you want. It's Heartbreak Hill up here at Rice Eccles Stadium. The Utah Utes were pummeled by the Oregon Ducks 35-6. to We'll be right back after a message from our sponsor. It's a community coming together to support University of Utah student-athletes. It's our town. It's our team. Our town. Our team. Crimson Collective, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. We're in. Our team. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. Crimson Collective, our town, our team. Welcome back to the show. Um, Devin Kafusi, what do you think about Bryson Barnes? I mean, he was hot property after the big win in the Coliseum in L.A. last week. Comes in against a very talented Oregon Ducks team and falls short. What do you think about his performance and how it boats the rest of the season? Yeah, you know, Bryson's my boy. Killer performance last week, best of his career. Today, a letdown um, for sure. Um, kind of what we hit on earlier is just the whole offense, from the defense to the offense wasn't playing our game, was very uncharacteristic there. Um, you know, Bryson had some tough turnovers there as well, especially as the quarterback, you know, you know, coming off a big win, coming home, you want to be that field general out there and take control of the environment. Uh, we just weren't able to see that out there. But knowing Bryson, who he is, you know, he's my boy. He's going to bounce back, like Coach Witt said. These losses, you know, put us in a situation to reveal that true character. As we know with Coach Witt, he's been that character of a man of being tough, being gritty, finding a way to bounce back and stay relentless. And we definitely know he's a fighter. Gabe Reed, what do you think, Bryson Barnes? Yeah, I'm a big Bryson Barnes fan. Uh, he's a gamer. He has been fairly consistent, I feel like, throughout the season. Uh, and people don't see the time that, that uh, athletes, and especially quarterbacks, put in, you know, from the end of the game to the next week in, in preparation. Um, and I have no doubt that he he did his due diligence. And uh, sometimes it just doesn't it doesn't pan out. Mm -hmm. And um, it's easy for the quarterback to be the scapegoat, but there's a lot of other things that come into into play in determining whether or not we get a W or a or an L. So I think yeah he has some stuff to clean up, but um, especially in these big games when when things are tight, things aren't going exactly as planned. Sometimes uh, we as competitors just you know, start to really try to make a play. And, and sometimes it pans out, sometimes it doesn't. But, yeah. The Rocket. Uh, one thing that I learned when you go through losses and you try to shoulder it, the easiest person to blame is the person in the mirror. And you've got to come to terms that there is certain circumstances that you can't overcome. He did do his due, due diligence and preparation. But Bryson Barnes is a pig farmer. That's part of the draw. You know he's a hard worker. You know he's dedicated to, what, to, this, to his craft. But I'm sure that he is aware, just like everybody else can figure out, there is poop that is involved with pig farming. Mm -hmm. And there are some games that end up you just play poopy today, and he will manage it just fine. I plan on him rebounding back. He's not going to take it personally. He's going to shovel it out of his way, and he's going to continue marching, leading this team down the field. Now, Devin, we know that this wasn't Bryson Barnes' best day on the field but the blame doesn't fall all on him. Talk a little bit about what happened with the team and, and who else is accountable here. Yes, absolutely. You know, there's 11 guys out there doing 11 different positions. Um, you know, Bryson, overall as a quarterback, is, is a big one out there. But, you know, like Coach Wood said, in the trenches, O-line got a 
win their blocks, you know, manhandle their one-on-one -on -one blocks, get off blocks to get to the next level, to allow those lanes to open up for their running backs to, you know, gain yards, you know, make a cut, make a guy miss here and there, which usually leads to our more explosive plays. We're able to see that um, there in the running game and, and as well as with our offensive line. Uh, Gabe Reed, what do you think? Yeah, I think there are more opportunities for plays to be made outside of the quarterback position, and that just needed to happen more today. Uh, there were several times throughout the game where it felt like big catches were made or there were some momentum swings with uh, defense causing a turnover and getting the ball mm -hmm. on our own 35-40 uh, uh, where we just needed people to step up and uh, capitalize on opportunities that were presented. But, um, yeah, across the board from the O-line to receivers uh, to running backs, we just weren't able to, to get string some, some big plays together. We couldn't execute. We couldn't execute, execute against that defense. Yeah. Yeah, they, they had answers for everywhere we yeah. wanted to be. Mm -hmm. um, they were who we thought they were, and yeah. they were everywhere we were trying to go. It doesn't fall strictly on Bryson. Right. But when you can't get more than two, three yards of carry, your field general starts to try to do things that are out of the game plan. And those turnovers were trying to make plays. They weren't bad throws. They were just trying to make plays. It was mistiming. It happens. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of things today that didn't go according to plan, but it shouldn't fall on anybody's shoulders by that. Everybody's got to watch the film. Yeah, and I'd say you have to credit Oregon. I mean, this is a top five uh, football team in the nation. There's no, you know, question about that. So a bad play on offense almost always correlates to a good play, not all the time, but a good or great play on the defensive side. So they have guys that are making plays mm -hmm. on that side of the ball. Um, so you have to give give credit to them as well. So I think within the last week, former Utah head coach Urban Meyer came out and said, Kyle Whittingham is the best coach in college football. And even after a loss like this, do we still think that might be true? Absolutely. I think it just shows the type of character that has been instilled within this program. When they highlighted Coach uh, Whittingham on ESPN earlier today, they made a big reference to his dad, Mad Dog, mm -hmm. Fred Whittingham. And I'm seeing a lot of Fred and Kyle, and Kyle has taken what his father taught him as a coach and elevated to a level that is on national recognition. I mean, he is a brand by himself, not because of who he is on TV or what he says, but what he produces here in the locker room. You guys experienced it, I mean, even more closely than I did his first year here. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think his post-game press conference is a, a great – representation of you know who he is mm -hmm. uh, he's a tough hard old school coach um, but he loves his players and uh, he is going to get the most out of them and and win or lose you know he's uh, gonna push the guys I think uh, you know we touched on NIL a little bit uh, coach Whittingham attracts at least for me personally the kinds of players that are uh, in it for more than just the money. So they're here to work hard, to be a part of a great culture, and that's what Coach Whittingham, uh, that's his staple. So, um, yeah, I have nothing but good things to say about Coach Witt. Devin, you're a Whittingham player. I am. I'm a big fan of Coach Witt. You know, he, him and my dad started their coaching career together here at Utah on the defensive line. <laughs> uh, I've been around the Whittinghams for a long time. My mom grew up with them. You know, as we talk about physicality being Utah's calling card, you know, toughness is definitely Coach Witt's. Um, you know, so it's his brand. It's, his, it's in his DNA. That toughness of that Whittingham, it shines through and it leaks off into the rest of the program. You know, it starts from the top and goes down. Thank goodness we have a Kyle Whittingham there at the top to handle us through times like this and to bring us a great time to come. We got an opportunity to interview Bryson Barnes on our show earlier this week. We want you to take a look. I'm Jack Bomeister, and you're watching Goal Line Gossip, proudly presented by UteFans.net. Today, we've got the pig farmer, Bryson Barnes. Bryson, how are we? Doing great. Happy to be here. Mate, they say uh, you never quit. What, why is that? How did, how did you develop those uh, attributes as a young man? Yeah, you know, I feel like, you know, kind of grow, growing up in a small town, you know, when you love something and you care for something, you're willing to sacrifice and do anything for that. So I feel like when it comes to football, I love the game of football. I love the teammates that I'm around. And so when you love something like that, you know, you're going to put in the sacrifice regardless of what the circumstances are. Who was the first person that made you feel like you could play ball after high school? I feel like it was my dad. You know, we'd go to football camps growing up and I'd be, you know, competing against dudes that were going to schools a lot bigger than I was. And 
my dad just kind of, I feel like, brought it to a reality to me on, on how I looked going against those guys, and I felt like, you know, it definitely kind of trickulated into me and building confidence in myself. Football was your best one, obviously, as we saw on the weekend, but what's your second best sport? Uh, baseball or wrestling. I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure which one I'm better at. I just, I, I just played them both. What's your third best sport? Uh, I did track and field. Track was, it was okay. Hammer thrower or? Uh, <laughs> shot put. No, nah, no, nah, I ran the, like the long distance sprints. So like the 400, the 800 and like the hurdles and things like that. How about tennis or pickleball? How do you go swinging the racket? Uh, the racket, garbage. And the paddle for pickleball, um, averagely garbage. Yeah. <laughs> have you ever punted or kicked? No, no, I don't have a special leg like you, Betty. Would you like to learn? <laughs> no. It is always good to have something to fall back on. You might be able to teach me how to throw as well, although I'm not too bad at slinging it. All right, yeah, yeah. I've seen you sling it a few times before, but yeah, I, I can teach you a little bit, but I don't want to kick. And uh, how's the misses with uh, football and stuff? Is it good? Obviously good to go home, um, rebound and stuff. How's, how's she with the game? And she's a massive supporter, as, as I can see, your beautiful wife. So how's she? Uh, she's doing great, and yeah, having a wife during this whole thing, you know, through all the ups and downs of football, like she just kind of keeps me level-headed, keeps me focused on what I need to be doing and what I can do better, obviously. This is the great thing about wives is they'll, they'll tell you when you need to be doing better at something. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, she always keeps my head on straight and just always good to have her to come home to and just kind of decompress from the day. She asked me to ask you when your anniversary is. Can you, uh, can you give us that date? February 13th, 2021. And that, that, was, that was the third take of that shot. That was the third take. <laughs> Guilty. All the fans are wondering, what are you going to be for Halloween? Uh, I'm going to be a football player wearing a Utah number 16 jersey at practice. you got a 265-pound middle linebacker. He's got a 10-yard start and he's coming down here later. What are you, what are you thinking in that scenario? Uh, get out of the way because I took a probably about a 220 pound linebacker and if you're not ready for the hit it doesn't feel that great so yeah. first try to get out of the way two embrace the hit and three hopefully you see it coming <laughs> uh if that was to happen to me what what advice would you give me well if you don't get the air knocked out of you get your breath back tell them that probably wasn't very nice <laughs> but just sh sh show them that you weren't actually hurt <laughs> it hurts his ego as a teammate I know, and the team knows what you're capable of, but you put that on show on the weekend. So how does it feel to finally, I guess, uh, well, you're undefeated as a starter, but finally, like, establish yourself and show everyone what we all know you've been capable of. Yeah, you know, it, it feels great to be able to go in there, be able to click on all cylinders on offense, be able to put up good numbers, and just at the end of the day, coming out with a win. And, you know, that's kind of the best part is you wake up Sunday, you're sore as crap, but it's, the soreness feels a lot better when you win. Are there any questions that you are hoping that I'd ask you? That is, you want to any records you want to tell everyone about? Or I like waffles more than pancakes. <laughs> I'm Jack Barmesa. I'm Bryson Barnes, and you're, and you're watching UFans.net. The Ken Garf University Club in Rice-Eccles Stadium is Utah's premier social club. Members enjoy incredible dining experiences, co-working spaces, exclusive member events, and fun game experiences like tailgating, pep rallies, and watch parties. Membership starts as low as $80 a month and is actively accepting new memberships. To learn more about joining this beautiful club, go to KenGarfUniversityClub.com to learn more. Thanks for joining us for another great episode of The Extra Point, and thanks to Gabe, Cal, and Devin for joining us on the show today. Check us out after the ASU game next week, and go Utes!